Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Dave, for having me here today. And um, as Bob said, uh, I am the Assistant Director of Aviation for Planning and Engineering. My division is responsible for the capital programs at both airports. Uh, since I've been here, and I'm sure many years before, the Aviation Department has managed its own capital programs. Um, I think in the early days, they may have been managed by Public Works from City Hall, but in the 20 to 30 years, it's, they've been managed out at the Aviation Department, again, to keep that wall there that uh, the aviation people manage their own capital programs. Uh, my talk today, what I'd like to do is go through the past major capital works. This will be a very high level. I'm not going to touch on every one of the couple of hundred projects that have gone on in the 40 years, and that'll get us to the current status of the airport, and then talk about the future things, which is really the things that have not been touched. So we'll go through fairly quickly, if I'm not sure how much time you guys want to spend on these, but feel free to, I guess, ask your questions. Is that Won't stay where I want it. How's that? Is that better? I'm sorry. Uh, this is what the airport looked like in 1972. I actually could not find a 72 area, but I found a 76 one. This is what we look like. The uh, three terminals were dropped into the then existing TWA overhaul base. The overhaul base still existing today is here. The three terminals landed there. Um, I just threw this one in to say this is what we look like in 76. This is look what we look like now in 2012. And I was going to divide you up into teams to see who could spot the diffs between the 40-year, 50-year development of the airport. But we won't go into that. And again, my focus today will be on the terminal area, not the uh, airfield changes. Just one. Yes, sir. If you go back, I was really struck by the contrast in, in the overall development of either what it takes to run an airport today versus 1976 or what the airport has spawned. Either way, there's a lot of development that is going on up there uh, in and around the airport. I mean, again, I can touch on this as far as the, this is our new rental car facility opened in uh, 07. The uh, economy parking lots are here with the bus to get you to the terminals. Uh, I think 15,000 spaces were created in 2003. Uh, so again, it takes a lot to keep an airport evolving to meet the needs of the area and the uh, aviation demand. So again, this is our focus on the three terminals, what they look like basically in 72. Uh, you'll see the circular surface parking lots in between all three, each of the three terminals. 1987 was the first major capital work that I could find, and that is the construction of the parking garage in Terminal A. And in 1990, we added the garage in Terminal B. We also expanded the uh, circle parking lots, again, meeting the needs, the ever-changing needs of the traveling public. Uh, we call these the circle lots, E1, 2, 3, and 4. And like I said, in 1990, we finished the second of the three garages. 1995, we had to do the abatement. This is an interior shot of the terminal buildings. These coffers were sprayed with uh, very good acoustic and thermal insulating material which contained asbestos and as all other airports and facilities had to do we had to build a scaffolding across here so that all this could be scraped and removed and then we put a spray back that returned the acoustic and uh, thermal properties of that fluffy material up there. Uh, the, the airport was opened with a central steam producing plant and chill water producing plant that fed the three terminals with chill water and the uh, steam going to each of the three terminals. And in 1996, we did replace all three chillers. So the original chillers from 72 were replaced in the central plant. And in 1997, we completed the, th the third of the three garages, one for each terminal building. And again, if you'll notice, there are other changes. We have a new air traffic control tower, um, more presence by the FAA in this area. The satellite lot was in use certainly in that time. And in 2000, we came across our steam plant needed to be looked at. We had already replaced the uh, steam lines, underground steam lines, distributing the steam to the three terminals once before, I think around 1990. And so we were looking at having to replace them a second time as well as major work on the boiler, the steam producing boiler in the central plant. 
it was decided at the time it would be best to go into the hot water boiler business rather than replacing steam lines. <laughs> they just take a beating underground from all the high pressure steam and the condensate return and the other things. So we now have six boilers, two in each terminal, and this, the steam lines have basically been abandoned in place other than if those who recall, they used to be exposed along the edges of the bridges and that those, they have been cleaned up and removed now. So we now have... Uh, Phil? Yes, sir. Uh, anybody else has questions, just fire them out. This, Please. This, this is, I'm going to learn from this. Um, go back to one slide. So you said that the blue line has been abandoned. Now the red. The red line has been abandoned. I was going with red for the hot side and blue with the okay, chilling got side. Got it. <laughs> That's rudimentary, Bob. I'm an engineer. I'm sorry. I apologize. I am the engineer. Now you got the red bus, the blue bus. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, it could be. We okay. stay with primary colors when we can. Okay. <laughs> so again, we have six of these, uh, two in each terminal. And this is a view of the central plant as it exists today. Uh, the building maintenance folks have moved into where the huge boiler used to be. And the other interesting fun fact here is that this round thing here is the chase that used to accommodate the flue from the boiler up to the roof of our, uh, now the police building. But the uh, Wi-Fi providers find that this is a very nice location for their cell phone antennas and such to broadcast and receive their signal into the three terminals. So the flue chase was repurposed to run wires up to the roof of the central plant. So we, we try to find clever ways to do things whenever we can. Um, and now we move to the terminal improvement program. Uh, this, is, this is the timeline of when it started. We completed our master plan update in 1995 and following its approval by the FAA, we then in, uh, began the TIP. I'll call it the TIP throughout. It's the terminal improvement program. In 96 and 97, we, uh, we worked on the project development to determine the specific extent of the renovations that we really wanted to do, and we also selected the architectural team. And again, this is all out at Aviation, not, not Public Works or City Hall. And in 2008, 1998 to 2000, uh, we advanced the architectural engineering designs so we could get to the bid documents. We also selected a program management team. This is kind of an extension of staff to say we need these extra expertise people to come in and help us with this program. And uh, the biggest thing they did for us is, of course, the construction phasing. At the time, we had 12 airlines and other tenants that we had to keep functioning while we in embarked on this ambitious program. And then 2000 to 2004 was when TIP was actually under construction in the three terminals. Yes. A couple of things I wanted to note on this slide in particular is that uh, look at the look at the timeline of this, of this major project, uh, the 1995 airport master plan, and it, yes, it had to be approved by the FAA. They didn't break ground. It didn't look like until probably five years later. That's correct. You know, so there, there's a, there's a real time delay in getting through this process. And the other thing I noticed, right after they or, you know, within a year of breaking ground, doing you know, all this work in 95 and 2000, and in 2001, remember what happened? We yes. Had, we had the 9-11, the right in the middle of breaking ground and, and constructing. They, they had to, I'm sure, probably change a few things. Yes, we did. That'll be on a future slide here where we okay. get into the TIP program. Uh, as, as Dave said, we started with the roof. It was the first thing we, we removed all the roofing materials, the sloping insulation and other things, totally replaced the roof in 2000. TIP was also a complete demolition of the interior. We like to call it a complete gut and chuck. Uh, anything that was loose or not even that loose inside the terminal was basically removed. Uh, if those of you remember the early days, this was the uh, sign band or the graphics band that was around the land side of the terminal. We determined to remove that and then we put a light sandblast on everything so that all the exposed concrete would look uniform because some of this concrete had never been exposed before. And so we, again, that was part of the demolition and the build back program. We also replaced, we removed all the exterior glazing, all the, the we used to call this KCI brown and it's pretty much gone from the airport now. 
replace it with higher performing glazing uh, of the current age of 2000 with new Moyen system. We also replaced all the floor finishes. This is another view of the sign band that we removed. And you can see it brought down a soffit to about an eight foot elevation at the entries from the uh, curbside. And with it removed, really opened up the, uh, the space inside the terminal. New, new floors, wood floors gone, terrazzo's in, um, all new wall finishes. Also, all new inbound and outbound baggage handling system. The uh, inbound system is the baggage claim device that the public sees. And the outbound system is more what you see behind the ticket counter, getting the bags downstairs to the uh, bag handlers. Uh, we also bought 45 new passenger boarding bridges, and I think we refurbished three others. Uh, this included all the, this is cabin air. This is a big air conditioning system, and the yellow tube connects to the aircraft. There's also a plug-in for the ground power so the air, airplane does not have to run its auxiliary power unit to save that fossil fuel emission and uh, keep the airplane cool while it sits on the ground. We also replaced in the basement, removed all the air handling equipment. Uh, as I recall, this, the, these, these are large air handlers. There's like four per equipment room and there's five equipment rooms in each terminal. But this thing seemed to be about the size of my uh, efficiency apartment I rented right out of school. But they are big with heating water coils, chill water coils, tempering coils. So again, in 2000, 2004, these were completely replaced. Uh, at the time, we were working with Mopub and uh, Aquila to get new utility transformers installed and new switch gear on our side of the house. Some of the switch gear was not replaced by the utility at the time, but we're working closely with KCPNL to make sure that stuff is upgraded and ready to continue to perform. We also rebuilt all the, all the public restrooms, new entries to the restrooms, what they look like inside. Uh, this was, as uh, Dave was saying, we had the walls before TIP where they, most of the airlines built them. They would come in, build what they needed to do, and some of them built these walls seven and a half foot tall, some were eight and a half. As uh, Dave said, when we started TIP, we were going to replace them all with eight foot high glass walls when the uh, events of 9-11 happened, and this is before TSA. TSA has not even been created yet. We're still working with the FAA. And we said, we need to go to 12 feet with these walls. Just, just had to do it. And we also went to blast resistant glazing. This has the laminate film inside so that the, the glass panel will stay intact should there be a curbside bomb or other things. Again, another a step in a change order in the middle of the TIP project to be flexible and keep things going. We also replaced all the airline ticket counters. Uh, we came up with a new um, standard shell so that we could build a shell, the airline just has to bring in his cabinetry and drop it in the back. So again, to be flexible so airlines can be added uh, very quickly to the uh, terminals. Uh, we also, as the, as the terminal improvement program developed, some of the airlines did want larger hold rooms. We had to work with each airline, again 12 of them, to determine who would be able to pony up the extra rent for the added hold room. And so I think about six of the airlines or five decided they would like a bump out. And so this is the apron side of the terminal building. This is the operations level that the public doesn't see. This is the floor that we call the PSL. That's where the public is, and that's what this is. This is the floor. So we had to bump this out. It varied anywhere from 7 and a half feet to 12 to 15. I think Southwest wanted a big bump out onto the air side. But this, these bump outs are they're a challenge because they affect where the airplanes are now parking. And the parking positions also govern where the hydrant fuel pits are located. And so it's a major design issue to get the striping on the apron correct so the airplanes can still park and still get their hydrant fuel while we give this additional floor space. And again, the airlines had to accept it that they were going to be paying for more square footage. And they all didn't want to do that. Uh, we also <coughs> replaced all the signage, all the wayfinding signage, gate numbering. And again, this is a picture without the sign ban, which I think was a very good improvement for the TIP program. Uh, we also, the concessionaires, their term of their agreements were also expiring during and around the TIP program. So that we went through a new RFP process to get the food and, uh, food and beverage concession assigned and the gift and news concession assigned. This time it worked out fine so we could get them into the construction site they could build their own tenant improvements and open their brand new concession venues along with that phase of the terminal whenever it opened. We also installed our major data network 
connecting all three terminals with our management building and the central plant. So we could have FIDs and BIDs, which are flight information display system and baggage information display systems. The airlines are connected to this so they can update their, uh, their flight arrivals and departures as well. And we can also have visual paging. So again, that's another program that, that TIP did for us. We also did a land side expansion. Uh, this is the door, the front doors of the terminal as it existed uh, before TIP. And this is an X column. And so what we decided to do is blow these out to make the vestibules deeper. But we also bumped out every one of these bays between columns. And so this is in construction. We bumped out the interior space, taking up some more of the curb front. Um, but this resulted in, again, every one of these bays are bumped out to either house a seating, a public seating area or a food and beverage venue or a gift and news venue. Uh, again, we, we kind of brought it out as far as we felt was reasonable to keep people able to walk up and along the curb front and not step into traffic. Uh, following the TIP program, this, I'm done with TIP. Are there any questions about TIP, I guess? Um, not in those words. I, not, I haven't heard those terms used. Okay, sorry. Well, <laughs> just in terms of, you know, the investment made relative to the benefit, uh, that it's going to, uh, accomplish either for the airlines, the community, uh, the airport itself in terms of energy savings or any operational savings, any of that. I factor think in all the thing, all of those things are factored in. I wouldn't say to my knowledge, there's a comprehensive formal report. But we work with the airlines because they fund a lot of this. If they're in agreement, we're probably going to go forward with it. Uh, and that's how the Terminal Improvement Program expanded and got to its quarter of, a quarter of a billion dollar program. Is the airlines, when we first met with them, told us that these loading bridges are, some of them we own, some of them you own. Uh, I took over a bridge that TWA used to have, and I don't know if they maintain the darn thing. So they made the suggestion, why don't the airport buy the bridges? And at this time, we also had the PFC program started up. And so it made a lot of sense to get all the bridges under the PSC funded by that fun new funding source. And that same thing happened with the inline, uh, excuse me, the inbound and outbound bag systems. The airline suggested we take that over. They agreed they would pay for the service maintenance contract to maintain the bridges and just made sense. And again, I guess for me, if it makes sense to the airlines, it's a good business sense because they're, they're the ones serving the public. Well, maybe because the business cases on airlines, right? Correct, I would, I would assume that, yes. They don't come in here with a lost leader, I don't think, <laughs> to add flights. John, do you have a comment that Paul's question? Yeah, okay. I think maybe one way of also looking at it, too, if I remember correctly, the aviation department every five years has to update their master plan? Correct. Uh, I'm not sure it's just five years. It's also if there's a major change in something. And, and is there a, a required uh, template that the yes. aviation department mandates that every year? Absolutely. I'm wondering if Yes, I was going to also answer the chime in on that, Paul. I, I know that, uh, for example, one of our one of our sessions is when it is to to evaluate what the aviation department and its consultants put together on a single terminal plan, where they monetize all different aspects to that, how it's going to be funded, how much it's going to come from fees and revenue from restaurants and the, you know it's, it's like all kinds of moving different alternative funding sources. That's kind of what you're getting at, I think. Uh, yeah, well, I think the historical perspective is good, right? If, if we're looking at recommending a major change going forward, what's the history then of the investment in the airport and the benefits that it's had, right, relative to what we could expect or what things would work differently in our recommendation? Yeah, and our hope is that we would do that not only for the Kansas City Airport, but also other airports, and have the benefit of hindsight in our benchmark. So that's absolutely. Alicia? Um, in the presentation, you talked about the replacement of air handling systems and duct work and electrical switch gear and panel boards. Is that one setup per terminal, or are there several setups? Uh, in each, each terminal has five mech rooms in the uh, basement level 
and uh, each mech room has four air handling units and one and I think two service transformers in each of those five places. So there's 15 mech rooms with four air handlers and two sets of uh, electrical switchgear. Yes. Uh, one more question. On the, um, you mentioned a lot of change orders, and obviously when you were doing the RFPs for concessions, there probably was some difference between the strategy of concessions versus 2000 versus after 2001, right, the security changes. Did that impact the number or type of concessioners that we had because the value of being inside security versus outside security? I think the, the two concessions that we have have been very um, – forward looking to get into the hold rooms as best they can. Now they work closely with the airlines because the airlines see them as a benefit if they get into the whole departure lounge as well. Um, and so again, it's a, a business situation that they work out. It costs a lot for them to move into the departure lounge because that's another labor person for three shifts to cover the length of time. But again, they do a very good job because again, if they can sell you a cup of coffee, they will make every effort to do that. And again, the airline has to be cooperative to give up that floor space yeah, in the so area that right uh, post tip we are now done with the dip program um, the FAA came up with like I believe this program here the inline check baggage screening uh, was like the last bit of FAA airport improvement program grant money that they would give to security projects the TSA and the Department of Homeland Security was just in its infancy, and so they said, this is it. You know, the DHS and TSA can fund their stuff from here on out. So we got a grant, and the uh, inline check baggage screening is when you, when the airline attendant takes your bag and puts it on a conveyor belt, if you picture the above floor here is where they put it on the belt. It comes down through the floor, goes through here, and this is the CTX machine. This is the X-ray uh, machine that the TSA uses to check your bag for explosives. An inline EDS is inline explosive detection system. So this is a complete automatic system that checks the bag and the bag flows on through to get to the outbound uh, makeup device that the baggage handlers get the bags and take the bags to the aircraft. Now some of the airlines were canvassed and they said, well, in, eight, in 07, this is way too new technology. We don't want to rely on, I think there's like six or seven computer controlled short little pieces of belt here because the bag has to be managed while this thing is resolving what it's, the image it's seeing. And so one of the airlines said, we don't want that technology. We'll keep it by uh, just the, the TSA people swabbing a bag and doing that inspection. So we did this for six of the, at the time, 10 airlines. Again, post tip, we lost two airlines after 9-11, at least two airlines. So we can only do this for six of them. But the other key point is that this is our airside uh, boundary with, this is where the aircraft park where they must be managed and maintained to get to the loading bridges, to get to the terminal and into the facility. This bump out is required because this stuff is, is large at, uh, and all these belts. So this is a big, for me, it's a big bump out into the planning of how we handle the air side. We're giving up a lot of freedom of where we can park the different gauges of aircraft all around the terminal building. So we've done this now, I think we've got six of these bump outs and they vary in size, but it's this technology really can't find its way to fit under here. Uh, we did the best we can. Some of them are half under and half not under. Others, like this one, is just a bump out right out onto the apron. Um, and so again, we have to work with that as the airlines change and shift their fleet mix to make it work. So Phil, yes. when I open my bag, there's a security. <laughs> yes. It's probably put in this room. This is the TSA resolution room. And so if a bag is a suspect by the device, it comes around, it's kicked into another conveyor to drop itself here, and they'll look at it, swab it with their uh, electronic trace detecting equipment, and then, like you say, put the little blue slip of paper in there that you've been seen, and then they put it back on this conveyor, and that goes up and around and out to the aircraft. And so, if there's, so for the airlines that don't enjoy this, Equipment bump out on the, on the tarmac. Right. What are they? Um, so we have so some it, safe bags and some unsafe. No, they're all safe. They're all the. <laughs> and which ones are the? <laughs> all bags go through appropriate screening process before they're put on the aircraft. The the manual systems. If you fly the Southwest, uh, they have three manual machines beside their ticket counter. 
and every bag is put through there and if they if it's suspect from that machine they'll take it behind the counter do the swabbing do the inspection put the blue thing in there and send it on to the aircraft but Southwest at the time felt like this was reliant way too much on technology they didn't want their on time um, record to be dependent on that kind of technology at that time now of course five six years later where's ours so um, things evolve things move on the fly Phil, yes um, how are things like the inline check baggage screening which I assume is an FAA requirement um, how are those systems paid for well in this case well in this case this was the last grant from the FAA to help with security all, f all current and after this time uh, was paid for by the TSA either through grants or they just doing the work themselves the primary claim for the TSA is that not is that ten dollars per ticket that we saw. I believe so. I think that's the uh, post 9/11 collection fee of ten dollars per ticket. We saw that on the ticket picture. Right. Yes. So both methods are acceptable. Yes. Uh, what do you think is the best way to go? Um, I'm not really in that business, but uh, I think they're both fine. I mean, the check, the bags are checked with the appropriate technology. Because again, the other, the other thing is an x-ray up above. It has the same x-ray technology, the same resolution. It's just not in line with a complicated automated conveyor system. So the bag is checked in the same technology. I, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but in other airports that are single terminal, is there one area that does this for all the airlines, or does each airline have this little building? Or now you're, you're correct. We're still fairly unique as far as every airline seems to have its own outbound bag system. Most other airports where the airlines are closer together, there's a common resolution room, common uh, outbound bag system for the check bag, and then it leaves there and goes out with proper baggage tagging to get to the airlines. In some places, the airlines have to share this device, uh, so the baggage handler is standing there next to another baggage handler looking for his tag to come around the carousel, grab it, and but. Um, Again, that is what air, current airports do. They can, the TSA can leverage your money a lot better by putting these things close together. And there's better redundancy. If this guy goes down, just this one piece of equipment goes down, this counter is back to manually doing the bag thing. But if you had a common system with three or four of these sitting there, one goes down, they just go to the other machine. Uh, and that brings on up to 11 to 12. Um, our chill water lines now needed re to be replaced recently. And what we did is right there, some of them were buried in the ground in front of the roadways. We put those on top of the canopy of the terminals just so I wouldn't have to be digging up my roads to get to those lines in the future. And these lines, we use this uh, cured in place uh, pipe um, solution to draw a sleeve in these pipes so that we didn't have to tear up these revenue generating parking lots. So we've, it was a very clever thing. I think we, uh, they'd been using this technology in wastewater lines and we decided let's give it a try in the chill water lines. And it seems it's a fiberglass, it's raw fiberglass like a boat. Uh, and the the uh, cloth and all is drawn inside the pipe and then they run hot water in there to cure the epoxy. And you've now got a fiberglass lined steel pipe, which again seems to be working very well for us. Now, that brings us to where we are today, pretty much trying to identify we've touched the chillers, we've touched the boilers, uh, but again, these, these projects are now getting a little bit old. The chillers were 96 vintage, the boilers are 2000, the roofing is 2000. Um, we'll go on to the next slide to show the infrastructure that we haven't touched. That's really what the next part is, what we have not touched. And as you guys have noted, we would like to improve the check baggage screening. We would like everybody to be in line. Uh, airside has infrastructure that hasn't been touched. Uh, the de-icing systems need, we need to address the de-icing. We have issues with the terminal parking garages being full, or at least the B terminal garage being full. We need to address that, and there are ways to do that. Uh, we need to continue, to, obviously, the preventive maintenance and monitoring programs on the major systems, but again, they're not, not all the same age. They have been in touch at different times. This is a spider web of underground utilities that exist in the terminal area. I think the red are electrical, the, some of the greenish are stormwater, the blue is water. Um, this is fuel oil, Jet A, that's under high pressure, under the eight, three, all three of the aprons. 
that's how aircraft are fueled. The uh, truck comes out and plugs into this thing in the ground and plugs through a filter into the aircraft. So we don't have to have tanker trucks driving all around the place. The fuel is in the ground and ready to be uh, refilled onto the aircraft. I mistakenly thought that was the red dust route. <laughs> And I think the, these large white lines are the FAA's lines going out to serve the airfield nav aids and other things. And I think also our, some of our electrical for the uh, airfield lighting share those uh, duct banks as well. So what I would like to do is, I think, again, this is a roadway in front of the terminal. This is a parking structure, and the terminal is here. The uh, red lines are kind of local electrical for the lighting, street lighting, but the blue lines are our domestic water supply as well as our fire protection supply lines. And these are still original. Uh, I repaved the road here in Terminal B, I think, three years ago and had to dig it up just two weeks ago because one of these lines broke, eroded, and we got a sinkhole, and we have to fix it. Um, you probably wonder why didn't TIP fix it? It's just very difficult to take a pie of the building and fix this length of domestic pressure piping. So I believe that once we, since we now have the market condition where we're going to move everybody into terminals B and C, A should be available to make a construction zone. What I think we should do is these are the roadways that have been, this is a cross section through the terminal building. Bob and I know what this is. Um, this is the concrete frame of our existing terminals. This is the roadway in front, which you walk across, and this is the, the floor level that you see, the blue terrazzo. This is the departure lounge. The aircraft are over here on the apron. And this is our basement. This is the chase area, we call it, where the air handlers and the switch gear are all located. Uh, we know we're having some issues with this basement wall. We, get it, or we are getting water intrusion. Uh, we're getting a lot of rusty looking stuff. So what I believe is we need to dig down this road. Um, we use a lot of road salt. And a lot of these utilities are backfilled with granular fills that will accept that moisture and transmit. So I think we're getting a lot of salt water intrusion down that could be damaging any, these walls. And the only real way to, to fix the waterproofing is to do it from the outside. If you do it from the inside, you'll just get the poor pressure of the earth pushing your waterproofing membrane in. So we do do what we can to keep the water and manage the water to go to a place that doesn't interfere with our operation. But to really fix this, we need to, to take this earth down to get to the wall, inspect it. And in addition to the basement wall, there's, 20, there's 2,200 lineal feet of this wall in the semicircle of each terminal. But also we have three tunnels connecting the terminal to the parking garage. Those tunnels also need to be looked at for their waterproofing. We do have leaks in those as well. Again, these things aren't major. They're just, you know, they just nag at you for why is that dripping? but it, it's never an easy fix. And while we br bring the backfill back up, that would also repair the lower structure of the roadway. All I've been able to do is really mill and overlay this rather than bring back the whole structure. A road is more than just the surface asphalt. And so while we're bringing this back up after fixing the walls and seeing what's wrong, uh, then we also replace the utilities while this facility is closed and not bothering anybody and we can actually get the utilities replaced. Uh, this is a, kind of the fun facts here of, again, it's hard to, we have a lot of these. Um, I had some better notes here. Yes? You said it was easier, obviously, to shut down the terminal and then fix that one while the other two are running. Yes. Is there, is there any way, any feasible way, to do what you just talked about while the terminal is still working? I don't think so. I haven't been able to think of a way that, again, when TIP was here, this was closed, but only a pie of it was closed. And I just don't see how I can get gravity lines to link up and keep the domestic water flowing to this terminal while I replace a piece of it. Um, why don't you put the utilities inside, like, because those things are all connected, why don't they go inside where you can get at them instead of burying them in the street? Well, right now, this chase is pretty well full with our heating water piping. Uh, we put our chill water piping up here because there's no place in the chase for it. There's also a major cable tray in here, as well as all the other duct work that's leaving the air handlers to get to the floor fed of this area. And also, this is the uh, service utility line. And I, I guess you could put pressure reducing valves and other things to protect you, but a major utility, I don't control the pressure in it. 
it could vary dramatically. And a lot of the utility lines, they rely on the, oil, on the soil for its support. And so I'd hate, again, my mind is saying <laughs> I don't see a way to move the pressure utility line into our already crowded chase. Bill, maybe a variation on the question would be if, in fact, you close down the terminal and you start redoing the roads and the wall, could you then do a utility wall <coughs> under the sidewalk or in the street? So sure. Is right, you could certainly do that. Again, that construction is permitted when this thing is closed. I'm not trying to keep something functioning, you know, 50 feet away from this cut section in the terminal building. I'm sure this is one of just many of the improvements you're going to talk about, but do you know what the estimated cost of all these all the capital improvements are going to cost over how many years? We have not put that together, no. These, well, I'm just trying to identify in this talk today what we have not touched and what we currently envision as a way of remedying the situation. Because again, these are 40-year-old utilities. There are pieces of them that are only four weeks old, but <laughs> most of them are <laughs> most of them are 40 years old. Yes. Um, with regard to that, those 40 year old utilities, our power needs are much greater now than they were when the airport was, was built. All you have to do is look at a terminal and see everybody looking for a plug in. Do we have the kind of infrastructure in place to serve um, the current needs? Uh, certainly the current needs, and we would like to get more outlets in here, but there's not many walls in there to put an outlet on. Some of the airlines have taken it upon themselves to bring in furniture and connect it to outlets and, and provide it that way, but again, that's kind of their choice. I'm not sure the airlines would support me doing it in every hold room because they see that as their market edge. Come fly my airline because I've got an outlet for you. So it, it's a tough deal. I believe we have the infrastructure and the power. We could likely do those things. And yes, there will be other utilities. <laughs> uh, th these are just interesting facts of saying where we are with our equipment. The t the, uh, between the three terminals, there are 24 el escalators that we maintain, and there are 43 elevators that we maintain throughout the three terminals. There are also 172 pairs of automatic sliding doors. So these things are various ages. Uh, I think some of the 87 elevators have had at least their hydraulic plunger replaced and other upgrades and we do have a service maintenance contract on all these things to keep them up to date but again it's not the same as replacing them and i guess is my philosophy if i can if i've got something closed down i want to grab everything that makes even maybe not makes all sense in the world to fix when i've got that area closed because the last thing i want to do is take an area out of service for six months bring it back, bring the airline back, and then go, oh, oops, I've got to go in there and fix this escalator now. Oh, why didn't you do that while you were here? So again, I'm not saying every one of these 24 escalators need to be replaced, or every one of the 43 elevators need to be replaced, but they require attention. Any equipment needs to be addressed when you're there, I believe, to get everything on a common baseline as you move forward. And again, we have elevators that are from the 72 construction. And again, the cabs have been updated and other things, and they're safe and all those things. But still, they're basic components that are the 40 years old and would need to be looked at in a comprehensive uh, stay here program. Yeah, and I, I learned that the types of elevators in the airport that are 40 years old are different than the elevators in the Bob's building that are like. <laughs> 80 or 90 years old, right? Yeah. Explain what that difference is and why one man has a lot of Well, the difference, as some of you would know, is these are hydraulic elevators, which are generally a little more fragile, less durable than the traction elevators that you see in high rise buildings. And so that's what Phil is addressing that, that the, uh, some of the equipment for those, particularly on the, on the land side, is below grade. Yes. So, so again, uh, the timing, there have been references made, in fact, in, in the uh, community forum. Uh, there was a comment made that many of us live in 100 year old houses and they're well maintained, and so if the airport's well maintained, what's the big deal with 40 years? And so uh, it, it depends on what you're talking about. And so, as, as I think Phil has at least helped us understand that there are
Correct. And again, we want to be out ahead of it. You know, we can't wait for it to fail. We need to be there in advance. And we have learned, as, as Bob said, the groundwater moving around, uh, working on our steel hydraulic cylinders that are in the ground that uh, have needed to be replaced. The ones we have replaced, we put in a PVC sleeve, of course, to keep the future plunger from encountering that groundwater. Uh, just, somebody just stay with that point. One of the issues I think that, that, that we heard repeatedly as we were preparing this bill is that it's unacceptable for them. While, while in our home, we can keep operating until the air conditioner breaks, and if there's a week delay in getting a new one, we can probably move into a hotel or something, whatever, <laughs> with a That's pretty much unacceptable uh, for Mark and Phil. They can't just say, well, sorry, we're not flying today or next week. So they really have to anticipate and make those improvements or replacements before failure. And that's Absolutely. part of what he's talking about. Right. My wife would like to use that same <laughs> now some of the other land side uh, improvements that we should probably be looking at making this is a ramp that's been with us forever and a lot of the people who use it again let me get you oriented this is the end of one of the terminals this is the road you drive into the terminal to drop somebody off pick somebody up this is a circle parking lot which is one level below the terminal we also, this is what we call Bond Circle. It is open to the public, but the public really has no business being down here. But this is where the airline and airport employees come to work in the terminal. So they have this ramp that uh, does not meet ADA um, requirements at all. It's way too long in its run uh, without a rest point in it. So the one way to fix it, we've, we've had designs done, is to put like three switchbacks in it so you get a landing, switch back, get another landing, switch back so the slope is appropriate and you get a flat to rest and keep going. This would probably end, the solution would probably end up being a two-stop elevator here if we can get this path here to, um, to be proper grade for ADA and get them to this point. Because again, a lot of people use this. A lot of the business travelers who park in these circle lots use the heck out of this ramp. Um, but we do accommodate ADA by another uh, method of they have to ride, they get to ride the red bus from, the, from their parking spots over here to the terminals. So this is not, we have an alternative accommodation for ADA access for the circle lot. Um, the next one I think I've discussed, the, the, the bridge there, oh, come on, I wanted to go backwards. How come I can't go backwards? Uh, this is the bridge I'm talking about in the next slide where this, this has been with us in 72 and it's been modified, it's been updated, the heating water lines were taken off of it, uh, has been rehabilitated as necessary, but I would like, if we have a terminal closed down, I would love to add a third lane here, because in Terminal B, traffic gets very congested in here, and uh, traffic backs up on this bridge and blocks are returned to terminal lane here. So again, I think it'd be very appropriate to put in this single, uh, add a lane to these six single lane, uh, six single span bridges at each of the terminal buildings. Uh, improvements to the check baggage system. I'd like to say we've, Mark has been talking about the airlines come and go. If I do this today, I've got to do three systems because we have three airlines that don't have it. Uh, in the near future when US Air and American combine, I only have to do it for two airlines. So, um, you know, pick your poison which one we're going to do next. And we also need to look back at the 07 and 08 uh, technology and make sure all the printed circuit boards are doing their right job. And again, we have a service contractor doing this. But again, TSA, I'm sure, has current operational needs that have not been necessarily incorporated into the existing systems. Now we go to the air side improvements. On the air side, again, parking garage, roadway in front, terminal building, the air side loading bridges and the apron. On this side of the terminal, we have the gravity sanitary sewer system underneath the apron pavement. We also have the Jet A fuel line that's under high pressure. Uh, again, there's a consortium company run by the, uh, in agreement with the airlines to take care of this. And they're doing a very good job. They're in compliance with all EPA things. But um, I believe that if I come out here, we have to excavate down as needed to get rid of the original wastewater utility mains and also excavate down and replace these underground fueling systems. That this apron, this is again another cross sections of the building more focused onto the air side. Um, this apron level is where the aircraft are. This is 15 inches of concrete. So we, and there's also 30 inches of improved base under that that we have to remove to get to this 
40-year-old wastewater sanitary uh, gravity line. And TIP replaced almost all the plumbing in here, but again, it connected it back down to the existing laterals and mains under the floor. So this, this again, it's 40 years. We have had trouble with it, and as you, we snake these things more often because, again, um, whoever the tenants are down here, it's not their home. They will put anything down a drain. And so we've had to snake these, and then we found, find a lot of interesting stuff in the pipes, and we have to dig out this floor to replace lengths of pipe. And I think uh, Henry has another piece to show me that uh, what they had to do down here. So again, I think with the terminal being closed, I can replace this line, and I can help the airline consortium replace this Jet A line, that it is 40 plus years old. Moving on to the, uh, the icing. Marcus talked a lot about our de-icing. What I think we need to do is construct centralized de-icing pads. We need to uh, construct the underground conveyance, the collection and the conveyance system. We can then evaluate our existing holding basins to see if they'll continue to serve. They were put in about the late 90s. Um, and these centralized pads will reduce the volume of runoff that we have to manage, you know, we have to collect and manage during the de-icing season. Um, so right now, working with the airlines in the late 90s, we said, how do you de-ice your aircraft? Oh, we want to de-ice them right here. You know, we all have our different chemicals. We all have our different procedures. So they wanted to de-ice at the gate or push back and uh, de-ice back here. I think that's what this cloud is. That's de-icing chemicals on the pavement. Um, and so we put in a, we redid the aprons back in the late 90s and added a storm collection system around the aprons as the airlines wished and built these basins to handle that runoff. Um, to, again, to ensure flexibility of the airlines, but that's 92 acres of watershed. Uh, in a one inch snowfall, that's a very manageable amount of moisture. Um, and then we get a decent little spring rain and that pushes all the de-icing chemicals <laughs> into this basin. Now what, what happens is if you get the perfect storm and we get a high rainfall rate, at some time it could potentially push this water across our little trench drains and out into the grass, and that's how it eventually gets into the, uh, the, the ponds and lakes out at the airport. We haven't had that very often, because again, we haven't exceeded the discharges, but we, have, we do see water, the de-icing chemicals showing up in our lakes to some degree. And what we do with the water now is uh, we have a cooperative, cooperative agreement with the Todd Creek Wastewater Plant, and they like, sometimes they like our glycol, um, water because it helps their bugs in their wastewater plant. So it's been a very cooperative agreement now. When this thing is full and at its peak and we believe rain is coming or another event, we will pump this out into tanker trucks and haul it overland to another wastewater treatment plant that's more set up to handle the large volumes. The other thing these de-icing centralized pads would do is I can better create a capture system and I'm having less runoff, and so the concentrations of de-icing chemicals are a lot higher, and it's more attractive to the reclaimers and the recycling people who would like to recycle this stuff. But when you have a little amount of de-icing chemical in a 92-acre watershed, it doesn't make a lot of business sense for them to separate out a teeny bit of de-icing. So this is something I think, uh, again, this is not a design, it's just a what I believe current technology would permit us to do to help our the icing system. Uh, we, we know we have a problem with the B garage. It fills up. We need to address that. That's revenue that we're not getting because these people, we believe, would continue to want to pay the rate of a parking structure. Research shows that the A and B garages were indeed constructed and designed to receive for future levels. Um, again, the HVAC systems in those existing stair towers probably need to be looked at as well. They are in the 87 and A and um, I forgot what you're 92 in the B garage. In the C garage, we look into the drawings, it was not designed to be expandable. So if we can't live with the number of parking places in the C garage, it probably needs to come down and be replaced. But this is a map showing this is the portion, these foundations and these columns and all that in this area were built and designed with extra reinforcing, extra design capacity, so we could add four levels here. Gets us about 300 cars per level. But what I find interesting is it's not connected to the garage, to the stair towers. 
So we'd have to build our own, it doesn't really show up here, but we'd have to build another elevator tower to serve these, nor these four future floors. And I believe this was truncated a little bit because at the time the air traffic control tower is back here and it has to see across to see the aircraft and the airfield. And since that time, there is a new tower, and I don't, I'm trying to find out how much difference in height it is, but I haven't been able to. But so we would have to, all of that would be in the evaluation of the program of what to do with the garages to expand their capacity. And somebody may come back and just say, you know, take the whole thing down and do a whole new modern garage. But I'm not saying we have to do that. This was provided for us by the folks in charge before I got here, and it, it might make some good sense. Circle lots, uh, again, these are very popular lots. They seem to fill up, uh, certainly for Terminal B. We could look at putting a parking structure out here again if we believe the demand is such that we need a garage. It's been done before to look at it. We didn't build it. We didn't think the demand would justify the cost of building a garage. But these lots are also aged as far as their pavement structure and their stormwater drainage system. And some of the slopes at the ADA uh, bus shelters need to be adjusted to meet current ADA standards. Now this, again, this, um, I'm nearly done. If anybody, any questions about the existing utilities? Because I'm pretty well done with what we might do in the future. And what I'm, the key, the next two slides are really what I believe is key to what we can and can't do at the airport. But what I've been making the assumption is that with moving all the airlines into B and C in the very near future, that gives me this construction zone. And we can do all those things in this construction zone. Now, we, we have to hire a program manager and consultants and all those things to get a program going. But I believe this market condition allows this to happen. And that market condition didn't exist for TIP. This was about all I could get to go under construction and TIP. And again, since this had to be functional, I couldn't take the whole road to do all the utility replacement. Uh, I had to keep this side operational. And of course, we talk about the, the terminals in fifths, five mechanical rooms, five electrical rooms per terminal. We could never get this division line to be one fifth. We always had to get temporary power across the magic line. Again, those are just the details of implementing a major construction program, but they all add to the complexity and the other things. And again, this is what TIP lived with, I think very appropriately. I think we're happy with what it did 12 years ago. Um, but if we have the benefit of, whoops, I'm trying to go back, come on. If we have the benefit of doing this, then I think that allows us to address the utilities that we just haven't touched. And what this doesn't show is there'll be other improvements into the center. This is where the central plan is. It also has basement walls that are 40 years old that are leaking uh, that need some attention. But this is the FAA traffic control tower. This is our airfield lighting vault. And so a lot of things in here are very key that need to be maintained and kept in service. But again, if, if we can take this down, I think we can get to the things that we have just not been able to touch. And I believe that is all I have.